Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our chats with Emily as we are calling our readings through all of the poems of Emily Dickinson contained in the Johnson edition. We're at poem 112, uh, where bells no more affright the morn. Uh, we're back to poem 13. In fact, we'll finish this lecture with poem 13. You'll remember when Emily asking her father to please allow her uh, to sleep a little bit longer. Uh, this is one of those wonderful poems. We love poems like this because we're reminded that Emily uses her art for so many different reasons. And here, it's going to be her wit. I love the fact that she will play games with hymns. We're going to talk about an Isaac Watts hymn that she will uh, play games with. It's also clear the relationship between her, she and her father is a fascinating one. We commented on it in earlier lectures, and here we're going to see more of that happening. Now, our assumptions, speaking of earlier lectures, uh, our assumptions, if you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down the left-hand side, again, chats with Emily, our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've been exposed to our set of introductory comments where we talked a little bit about Emily and her biography and the like. And then I'm hopeful that as well, you've already played with the previous 111 poems we just finished with The Bee Is Not Afraid Of Me. Um, now, there's, there's, I mean, we, we go from a poem like that, The Bee Is Not Afraid Of Me, where she, maybe she's playing around with Paradise Lost and Milton's ideas that she lives in this beautiful, tranquil place and yet something is lost, to a poem like this one, where she loves to play with language. Emily loves to play with hymns. In this case, it will be an Isaac, Isaac Watts uh, uh, um, uh, song that she will play with. Uh, the uh, great Oxford uh, scholar David Priest has pointed out that Emily loves this, what he calls her twinkle in the eye. And I, and, and I love this because she, you, clearly she's having fun in this, in this poem as she is asking her father, would you please give me some time to sleep? Now, again, remember... Emily writes so many of these lines in the nighttime. Uh, when everybody else is sleeping and the house is silent, that's when she'll write poems. So it would make sense that if she's up for much of the night writing, that she would maybe hope that a bell would not be summoned uh, in the morning to call her to breakfast. And she'll ask, she'll ask a little bit about this. By the way, notice the four wares of this poem. Where bells no more affright the morn, where scrabble never comes, where very nimble gentlemen are forced to keep their rooms, where tired children placid sleep through centuries of noon. This place is bliss. This town is heaven. Please, Bob, pretty soon. Oh, could we climb where Moses stood and view the landscape, or not father's bells, nor factories could scare us anymore. Now, again, this is a poem very specific, I think, specifically to Potter, to Father. And uh, notice where she starts. She starts with her where, where bells no more affright. We're back to poem 13, of course, and the whole bells that are waking us in the morning. Again, notice the affright of the morn. Uh, it, it's, the, the humor is, is palpable here. Where Scrabble never comes, Scrabble only used one time in all her poetry, it's here. Where very nimble gentlemen, go back to po poem 109 with the word nimble, um, and our comments about that. Of course, these nimble gentlemen are forced to keep their rooms. Well, think about where we are in Amherst and the whole uh, professor's of the college and the like, right? Those nimble uh, uh, gentlemen, known as capitalized gentlemen, where tired children, and I think it's significant that Emily is in her jesting, commenting on the fact that she is tired, she is fatigued. Of course, ch children here capitalized, placid sleep through centuries of noon. Uh, again, the overstatement, the hyperbole is fun. This place is bliss, and of course, her use of the word bliss has already been, we've already commented on that. This town is heaven. Uh, and then notice the alliteration of please, Patra, pretty soon. Uh, the idea of pretty please and the way she plays with it. By the way, Patra only gets used one time and it's here. And then what she does is she plays around with um, uh, an Isaac Watt hymn that um, will, uh, will be called There is a Land of Pure Delight. And in the uh, third stanza, uh, uh, and the fourth stanza here of this, of this hymn, this is how it reads. Could we but climb where Moses stood and view the landscape o'er, not Jordan's stream nor death's cold flood could fright us from the shore. So what she does is she plays around it. As we commented on her quoting a biblical text, it'll be the same here. She'll say, oh, instead of just could. 
could we climb where Moses stood? Could we but climb where Moses stood is the Isaac Watts line uh, and view the landscape or that line is exactly quoted and then notice with the uh, quotation marks she'll then move away from the quotation marks um, to not fathers, bells, nor factories could scare us anymore. It's not Jordan's stream nor death's cold flood could fright us. Notice for Emily it's scare us from the shore only notice it's not the shore it's any more well th to me this is this is amazing example of Emily's humor you know sometimes people said to me she's so morose I just can't read Emily Dickinson I'm like well what about poem 112 uh, which is so much fun right in other words Emily loves her rest and she's obviously begging for more rest I think there is a there, there is a message here as well that waking up is hard remember what Thoreau says in Walden we've given full lectures at learnstrong.net we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake not by mechanical aids but by an infinite expectation of the dawn that does not forsake us and our sound asleep I think that mechanical aids thing would be this father ringing the bell to get them all up to make them come to breakfast um, at 2b I love, again, the, allu the, um, uh, uh, the allusion, the referencing to Watts, and then the adaptation to it. It's fun. The tongue-in-cheek banter with her own father, obviously. My Emily group, who I've, I, I've enjoyed uh, discussing so many of these poems with them, um, they pointed out the negative trinity of a fright and scrabble and scare and, of course, the alliterative power of uh, please and padre and, pe and pretty. But of course, really where we're going is back to poem 13. You'll remember, sleep is supposed to be by souls of sanity, the shutting of the eye. Sleep is the station grand down which on either hand the hosts of witness stand. Morn is supposed to be by people of degree the breaking of the day. Morning has not occurred. That shall Aurora be east of eternity, one with a banner gay, one in the red array. That is the break of day. Uh, again, the, the longing to her father. Please, just let me, please let me get a little bit of sleep. Finally, in 3B, I think it's easy to own a poem like this by asking a couple of simple questions. Are you, some of you are already smiling, are you an early riser? Or do you have someone in your life that makes you a get up? Especially if you spend time at night. Several students who pick up Emily's poems start to be in, addicted to them and they'll find themselves reading at night, which means they have to sleep in in the morning. Maybe that's you. Thank you.